I thought it was interesting that some of you got the joke in the midst of the scripture reading and you, you laughed at the appropriate time, obviously. So did you hear the one about the boy who came into the sanctuary and he was looking at a list of names of people on a plaque in the back of the sanctuary and he said to the pastor, hey, who are all these people? And the pastor said, oh, these are men and women who died in the service. And he said, which one, the 8.30 or the 10 o'clock? <laughs> we, we like preacher jokes, right? Now Luke tells a preacher joke and I tell a preacher joke. Uh, it's just something that we like. So did you hear the one about the woman who came to church and the preacher was preaching on and on and on and finally she gets up and she walks to the back and the usher says, where are you going? She says, I'm leaving. And he said, but the pastor, he's not done yet. He's not finished. And she said, oh, yes, he is. He just hasn't yet quit. <laughs> so, you know, we, we pastors, I think, deserve some of these jokes. And um, I think we should actually take them as a bit of a cautionary um, reminder to us. As I think about uh, the ribbing that we sometimes get for our preaching, I think of the words of Frederick Beekner. He's a writer, and he's also a preacher. And he said, it is for gr good reason why we have the phrase, don't preach to me. And it means, when people say this, don't bore me to death with your offensive platitudes. Right? He goes on to say, respectable verbs don't get into that kind of trouble entirely by accident. Think about it. So today, as we come to this text that's before us, um, this whole background of, of thinking about the jokes in Scripture is in my mind as I, as I read this text of Luke chapter 20 uh, of Acts. I, I think that the preacher joke here is really a cautionary tale for everyone. Luke is telling us a firsthand experience of listening to Paul preach in this upper room communion time. And I love the way the NIV translation says, and he talked on and on. And you can kind of imagine that Luke probably rolls his eyeballs as he writes that down in his history of the church. And you can probably imagine as well that as people retold this story about Paul preaching in that upper room in Troas, they probably said, oh, you remember that one when Paul went on and on? And what happened? So this was one of those stories that was just repeated over and over again. And in the historic events that Luke tells in his book of Acts, it's really filled with story after story, and some of them are comedy. You've laughed at some before. And some of them are tragedy. But this definitely is comedy. Shakespeare would probably call this all's well that ends well because everything works out, right? The boy is hot and is sitting in a windowsill, probably to be cooled off, and he falls down, and everybody thinks he's dead, but Paul goes up and grabs him, and miraculously, he's alive. And all's well that ends well. And the story goes on from there. But you know, as I think about this comic story told in Scripture, I don't think that the main joke is really the length of the sermon. Because if, if the, the length of the sermon was really the joke that Luke was telling here, then he wouldn't have so many long sermons in the midst of his history report of Scripture. As he's telling the narrative of the history of the early church, he, in Acts chapter 2, tells this long sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost when the church was born and the Holy Spirit just blew into the, into the uh, breaths of all these people and, and the church came alive. And if 
there was a concern about the length of a sermon, he wouldn't include in chapter 7 of Acts this long sermon of Stephen, this great early deacon in the church. And if there was a concern about the length of the sermon, there wouldn't be this long description of this the words of Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he's speaking on the Aragopagus in, in Athens. No, it's not so much the length of the sermon that's the joke here, it, because Paul has spoken long times on many other occasions and the words is included. I think the joke here is that Paul thought of himself as so important that he didn't get a good night's rest before his journey on in his mission trip. But he had some important words that he had to share, and so he stays up all night long to share them. And do you notice that of all the words of sermons in the scripture that we have recorded, Luke doesn't tell us a single thing that Paul said that night? I think that that's really the joke. It's not so much what the preacher says at all, but it's what God does. And not only do we have this message in the book of Acts uh, that happened in that day in Troas, but it really is a lesson for all of us as well because it's really not so much what the preacher has to say, but it's really what God is doing among God's people. That's the important thing. And it seems to me that Eutychus is an example for us to really think about and reflect on for our own lives in the midst of reflecting on how God is working in us. You know, like Eutychus, we all deal with stuff as we come into the sanctuary. We know what Eutychus was dealing with. It was probably really hot in this, the upper room. So have any of you been to Mexico? You know how in Mexico you, you want to get cooled off? You go to the upper floor and you let, let the breeze blow through on the upper floor? Well, here in the Mediterranean region, that's what they do. They go up to the upper floor. It's hot and muggy down below, but they get going up to the rooftop, to the top floor, to get a breeze. And here Eutychus sits in the window for a breeze. And not only that, um, this, the name indicates that this is probably a slave boy, and he's worked all day long. And so Paul is preaching, and he, he's, a, he's a Christian, and he's come to faith in Jesus, but it's getting long, and he starts falling asleep. And we know this is an eyewitness account of Luke who's telling us a story because of two things. He shifts his narrative from the third person to the first person, singular, describing, or to the the first person plural, saying, we, we, we did this, and we went there. In addition to that, he also describes the lamps in the room. Do you notice that? This is just a little observation of, of something that maybe nobody else that was telling the story would say. It's kind of like in uh, Mark's gospel. Mark tells us about Jesus who was asleep in the boat on a cushion in the boat. It's kind of like, remember that cushion? It's the yellow one with the red stripes. Yeah, that's where Jesus was, was sleeping. And so Luke is telling us the lamps were, were flickering. And, and so Eutychus was probably just... Um, it's starting to suffocate a little bit from the, the burning oil in this room. And he falls asleep. He's fighting sleep, and he falls asleep. And we, we, we deal with stuff when we come into this sanctuary where we're listening to God's word. Maybe you didn't get a good night's sleep last night. Maybe you're looking around at the candles. Where are the candles? We don't have the candles in here today, but we have flowers. Maybe you're looking at the robe or the, or the vestments. Or maybe you're going, man, it's, it's, it's hot in here. Or whatever it is, there's, there's something going on in you. And what the Spirit of God is teaching us through this text is, look, it's not what this guy is saying, but it's what the Holy Spirit is speaking in your life. What is God saying to you as we come to this place to worship God? The Spirit wind is blowing. 
And you know, when I think of this being Pentecost Sunday, it wasn't just 40, year, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus that the birthday of the church came and the spirit wind started blowing. But the spirit wind has been blowing and blowing and blowing again in the lives of Christians. And the question is, will we open ourselves to the breath of God's spirit that is continuing to blow? You know, people call this text the Acts of the Apostles. I've mentioned before, the better name for this is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not what the apostles say. It's not what the preachers do, but it's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. So here's the a, here's a questions, I think, for us as we come to our communion today, for you and me as we read this. Will we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit? Will we let the Spirit breathe in us? Will we even let him raise us up if we've fallen and we're dead in our spirits? Or it might not be that you feel like you're really particularly fallen. Maybe what you are is a little bit dizzy and broken and hurt by love's labor lost. Or maybe you have been a victim of a comedy of errors. Or maybe you've been injured from living only as you like it. The message of this comedy of scripture here in Luke is that all is well. All's well. When we gather together for communion and we open ourselves to the breath of his Holy Spirit working in us and through us. Let's do that as we now prepare for communion, shall we?